Some of your most remarkable work has shown a particular uh, sympathy for the urban fabric of Los Angeles and ways of reinventing it, like the Samata building, the Stealth building, the Umbrella, right. Right. all the buildings you've done in this area. Right. Your conjunctive I think, I think there, project. I think there is something about, it's not so much that Los Angeles obligates the architect. I think it's possible to argue that what really matters, the, the Russians came here the other day and w one minister was talking to me and said, you know, Eric, I think this place is more like a string of small towns. And what jumps out are, are the connectors, the big pieces of infrastructure. The Kodak building that we did a number of years ago, that digital design headquarters for Kodak, was, was, I think I've always talked about essentially as a piece of infrastructure. It's a big block in the air lifted up on legs like a, like a, like a hunk of the freeway. I think, I think there are, what, what is fortunate about Los Angeles is that it's not a city with a long history. It doesn't obligate architects in the way that almost every other city does. And therefore, it, it, if, if one is willing to take responsibility in an introverted sense, the extroverted world won't do it. I mean, we started this discussion and I was saying, well, it's conceivable that one could make one's own world. That might literally be true, not entirely so, but largely so in Los Angeles because there's not a lot which is obligatory and compelling either in terms of a, of a structure of buildings, uh, a quality of design, a pedigree of exceptional work. You don't really find that here a lot. So that, so that in my case, especially in the central city work, Los Angeles and, and Culver City, which is, which is ongoing, it was really very much up to me to make a definition for what constituted the building idea and the city planning idea, organizational strategies, program strategies. I had a lot of freedom to do that. Uh, we weren't always able to, to take everything down. And in fact, I started to understand the uses of, of existing structures or situations, not in a sacrosanct way, as if they were intrinsically so remarkable or so beautiful. But they had a memory. They, 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 a memory. Have, they have a history and they have an order. And in some cases, and, and I made this argument with the Queens Project recently, I think it's similar, that you have a discussion which I called recollecting forward. And so I think that's almost self-explanatory. It allows the use of existing organizational features, pieces of buildings, or railroad tracks, heights, roads, materials, in a certain way. So there is, there is history reading forwards and backwards. In other words, we haven't eradicated the record, but in some cases we've substantially remade it. In some ways it's quite recognizable, in other ways it's utterly unrecognizable. And I think the confidence to do both, it brings a kind of maturity to the discussion. We don't have to rub it all out. But there's a but certain we, tension between those two things. I, th I think, I think there is, and, yeah. and I'm not sure it's always a tension, but I think there's a consciousness that, that whatever you do, you always arrive in the middle. Or if it's not the middle, you always arrive in the midst of a site where there are other buildings, a history where there's a prehistory and a post-history. So you always land into something and, and, and begin to have to understand it, both in terms of what preceded you and in terms of the opportunity to remake the record. And I think in a lot of these cases here, there, there was an interest in my part in retaining some of the record and some of the history in terms of relationships to, of buildings to streets and to people who continue to live here, but also to suggest that the world could be utterly different, used differently, used more densely, more intensely, and could communicate a very different sensibility and meaning, but not entirely remove its, its antecedents. In terms of the f remarkable forms that you've come up with within this uh, 
context. Uh, I mean, what are the clues for that? Where is this purely individual imaginings? Uh, they're quite, you know, quite extraordinary. What, you know, where do they come from? I think there, there, there's an essay in an old Rizzoli book um, that I did with David Morton a number of years ago, and uh, there, the first essay, or there's a series of essays, one of which was originally called Which Lie Do You Want to Tell? And, and he, trying to help me stay out of trouble, changed the title to Which Truth Do You Want to Tell? I think there are a lot of ways to explain the, the, the making of these buildings, the shapes, the spaces, the organization. There is an interest on my part in, in just an intrinsic interest in a sense that most of experience as I intersect with whatever the world is, is not quite legible. And I think that, that what is apparently rational in some cases is an anomaly sitting in the midst of, of, of an experience which ultimately is not amenable to a kind of rational analysis. It's an intuitive response? Or? So, it's, so there's, there's something fundamentally impenetrable or enigmatic or at least complicated and difficult about the experience of living. And for all those who have rolled out solutions or explanations, there are a lot of ways to come at this. One could insist on rationalizing as much as possible. And even if you can't do it all, do as much as you can. I think I'm interested in, com in, in communicating something of that intrinsic uncertainty or unknowing but not by making a mess about it, but trying to be as articulate as I can about what ultimately probably can't be articulated. So it's, it's a poetic condition, could even be understood as a religious condition. But you could take all of that away and just look at the interest in making shape or form or space or in, surface. In, in itself, you mean? In itself which is a thrill and, 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 and a wonderful thing to, to, to have an opportunity to spend one's life on. I think the best example of that now in, in the office, the most current example, is the Mariinsky Theater with what we've, we've called modules. Some of this now gets to be tactical because a module implies an element which is part of some kind of logical, rational structure. And we have these modules which are fluid in, in a sense that they can be pushed and pulled to accommodate structure and circulation, concourses, seats, box seats, acoustics, ceilings, restaurants, and all of that, and pushing and pulling on them, and then, and then having the temerity to sit down with the Russian ministry and say, look, this is all absolutely inexorably logical and convincing. And you can't, you know, the plaza's here, we pulled the building here, the ceiling's here, we, did, we needed the lobby, we pushed into this. If you look at the pieces, they're, they're these clay pieces, which the computer is now turning into a plaster model, and then we're going to wrap that with an acrylic model. It's, it, it, it's fascinating. And, and I think it communicates the kind of, the kind of um, ambivalence about what we have to produce the world that, that we think we know. And, and I think the best way I could say that without offense to any of the women in the room is man exteriorizing man. You, see, you put enough of yourself out in front of you, you think that's all there is. But the interesting question... I'm trying not to do that. <laughs> the interesting question is when in this process of pushing and pulling and and testing the boundaries, what point of rest? How do you decide that you've, this is it, that you've come to the end of this, that this is the point of rest, or stasis, or whatever I guess, you call I it? I guess, I'm not sure stasis is the word. Well, when you finish uh, this, why do you stop there? I think, I, I mean, there, there used to be an argument that you're finished when the, when the owner or the contractor throws you off the site. Um, I think that, that um, 
there is, there is something about this process that ends at one building and starts at another building. I was, I was always very apprehensive about, and maybe I've done it anyway, about having work recognized as coming out of this office. And maybe that's an advantage. There are architects that, that clearly a signature, did that. Yeah. But maybe the, the signature is okay as a behavioral point of view. I'm not so sure. There are clearly things I wouldn't do. But I think there are a lot of areas where I'm not so sure what I will do. And I think the process of working on the building, which is a very slow and kind of clumsy process of pushing and pulling, and, in the, in the Russian thing, for example, so that the minister wants this and the conductor wants the other thing and a technical guy wants the other thing. And the people who are, who are looking at it as a city planning issue are concerned about the access and visibility and all, all of these things. And so there are, there are the, the normative, um, formulative forces that exist on all of these things. We're not talking about them very much. But I'm just saying I have this, this, this kind of goo, which will, oh, you want this? I'll give you this. And you want that? I'll give you that. So it, it, it does have the aspect of, of quite a rational toy or tool, which can incorporate a whole series of obligations and give you back what you asked for. So when somebody says, why is this so funny looking? And I can say, well, we did this, and we did this, and we did this. I actually don't think it's funny looking, but why does it not look like the, it doesn't look like the hermita, uh, Hermitage, and it doesn't look like the Admiralty, and it doesn't look like, but it looks like what it needs to look like, given the obligations that you've, that you've given us to do the project. But of course, this is a little disingenuous. Because I, I, I'm looking for something. I'm looking for something as a way of uh, in appearance and experience and all of that. So I'm trying to find ways of making what they want me to make. But you also want to surprise them to some degree. Yeah, I, want, I, think, I think that's possible. Not, not necessarily um, a surprise like a trick no, no, that I would mean, blow over. To go beyond more. Than, you to, know. to find a way to, um, uh, to discuss possibilities uh, that would open the discussion up uh, to venues that weren't anticipated originally. So when they said, okay, will you do this? And I said, I'll do this. And, and, and when they asked that of me, they anticipated something coming back because they know theaters and they run theaters and they have an experience. And all of a sudden, something somewhat different came back. And that changed the discussion because I think, I think whatever we claim about ourselves, there's always some interest in some kind of regular, predictable, stable, orderly. Well, that's intrinsic to the whole notion of architecture. I think stability. No, that order, that the world is, can be ordered. That this chaos of living can well, be ordered and shaped in a building. Well, chaos is a tough word. I think, I think oh, anarchy, what, what's, in, it what's, intrinsic, it, what's intrinsic, I think, Historically, the world continues to, I think I could claim this forever. I don't think this belongs to any particular time. That The world, whatever its problems, continues to reassess itself, reorder itself, and to insist that its way of <coughs> reordering is the way it is until it reorders it again. Do you see your role as an architect in continually Reevaluating that order. Well, I think I I always felt that I never believed that it that 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 these models were very durable, and I thought it was always my job to look in a critical way and to try to find subject matter and circumstance that would somehow be durable because it would contain in it a kind of critical seed of movement. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a matter of insisting on an ideology that wouldn't endure. It was a matter of, of trying to find a way to communicate the process of transformation. I think to some extent the Culver City argument, holding on to certain issues, moving certain issues, accepting certain conditions, contradicting certain conditions, actually, actually suggests a more complicated sense of understanding 
You could go into a tomb in the Yucatan. It used to be this. Somebody kicked those people out and did this on top of it. There's a, the, the Louvre is a house. The Louvre is a museum. I mean, I mean they're two just uh, very far afield examples. The gasometer, which we worked on for a long time, held gas. Now it's a housing project. You know, so the cities move in ways that, that I think would, would like to suggest, I mean, the people who wandered around Angkor Wat a thousand years ago, or the people who inhabited um, Chichen Itza 800 years ago, or the people who walked around in Stonehenge 2,000 years ago, in the time that they did that probably thought this was the world, this is the world, and this will be the world. I think I'm very interested in trying to understand which of those qualities are so. To what extent is Stonehenge still the world? I think they actually are quality. To, to what extent is, is, it, is it suggestive of what might the world might become? And to what extent is it just an anachronism? I think most people in those situations, they find themselves in situations where they think this is what defines the experience of living. And I think I'm trying to find a way to suggest that that container is never very solid, but that the people who make it, make it on the basis that it is solid. So the model that you were talking about, that it is uncertainty, I mean, that may be Sartre's view or Camus' view or Ionesco's view or Samuel Beckett's view. The, the people who are looking at this thing and, and looking at it critically, um, but uh, to name some early 20th century people who are of great interest to me. Um, but in general, I think the world looks for a kind of coherence and it looks for a kind of stability and it looks for models in particular in cities uh, and in city planning to, to ratify this kind of order and, and consistency. One of the reasons Los Angeles is, is, is appealing is that it, it itself is a sort of what are we? experience. I do think that, that uh, at some point I, I felt that I had to change, and I think we're in the process of doing it now in the last year or two, how the office represented itself in terms uh, to governments and to agencies and, and to people who were likely to be interested in this office, and a lot of people who wouldn't be at all. And then there, would, there are some who clearly would be, and then there's some others who might be. And I think we started to look at people who might be and to try to re-represent the office. And in order to do that, I think, and the purpose was to change the scale of work and the scale of the discussion, and to be able to participate, like the St. Petersburg Project, or the Queen's Museum in different kinds of design and city planning discussions in different parts of the world and to try to find a way to do that, which tends to make, uh, to make one somewhat more pragmatic and practical or at least to have that face available and accessible so that I think there's probably not a question about whether this office can make unusual or intriguing objects. I think there was still a question about whether this office could simultaneously solve practical, substantial kinds of programming, organizational, and, and uh, content issues at the same time. So that you can do the first, can you do the second in conjunction with the first? And I think we're in the process of trying very hard to demonstrate that we can do both.